Welcome back everyone. I'm finally putting out another video. The channel's not quite dead yet, don't worry. Uh, today I'm going to be painting this footsore Arthurian figure. It's part of their sub-Roman range. This is actually one of the Knights of the Round Table. I think it's Tristan on their website. Uh, I'm going to be using him as a command figure for my Saxon army. I think he, ha he he's looking a little bit more Germanic, Celtic than uh, Roman here, but it's a really cool range from Footsore. I'll link it down in the description below. And I had a lot of fun painting this character. It's a very dynamic pose and has a lot of life to it. So sit back as we go through and I paint this Arthurian legend here. So the first thing I'm going to do on this model is I am going to paint the metallics first because I'm usually pretty messy with my metallic colors and I know that I'm going to get it over all of the clothing and such. So I always just paint it first. And here I'm using the Vallejo model color steel. And I'm covering all the areas of his helmet. I'll be covering his chainmail and the boss and spear and all that sort of stuff. And I love this uh, metallic color from Vallejo as a base color. It covers very nicely. It's very, it's meant to be shot out of an airbrush. So it's very liquid base. So it's not really good for like dry brushing, but it makes great base coats and highlight colors. So I'll put this down as my base. And then I'm going to go and use some P3 steel, which is actually a, a much lighter. It's almost like the silver color from Vallejo. And I'm going to just overbrush all of the metallic areas. Again, this isn't really a, really a dry brush. I have quite a bit of paint on my brush. I'm just covering most of the areas as my first highlight. And I'm going to be spending quite a bit of time on the metallics for this. I haven't been happy with my metallics, my true metallics game recently. So I'm going to go kind of above and beyond what I usually do. But here I'm just adding a little bit of a wash. It's P3 armor wash all over the helmet, the chainmail, and the spear. It's not just a black wash. It has a little bit, I think, of a blue and maybe brown in there. It has a, a nice quality to it. So I'm a big fan of this P3 wash. And then we're going to go and back to the Vallejo metal colors. And here I'm using a silver to highlight all the areas on the chainmail and helmet that I know light's going to be touching. So here, the, the top of his helm, um, right inside those little indentions in the helm too, where right and kind of on the curvature of the helm. And then I'm going to be using this all across the chainmail here. And I'm going to be using a different technique, a technique that I saw from a great painter, Nex Betu Nek Metu. He's a Facebook guy. Anyways, he takes his highlights on chainmail and really just really concentrates them in one area. He even takes the highlight layers and pushes them in between the folds of the links, which usually people don't do. And it does a great job of drawing your eye and giving some contrast on chainmail. Oftentimes, chainmail just kind of looks all the same. And then just to further emphasize the highlights and the shadows, I'm taking the gunmetal color from Vallejo Metal, which is a, about a black metal. And I'm going and I'm hitting all the areas that I want to be in shadow. I'm even going over the tops of the ringlets there. So some of the chainmail is pretty much just looks straight black. Um, this is a, a new technique I've been using. And I really do think it helps draw your eye to highlights on chainmail a little bit better. And I'm going back and I'm also putting in the shadows all across the helmet with that gun metal. I've started using, uh, I guess midtones as my first layer and then going and adding the shadows by hand instead of starting with the shadows and layering up. And it's, it's, I'm still not, I haven't perfected the technique, but I think you can get more contrast, more di dynamic shadows if you put them in by hand. And now that my metallics are pretty much done, I'm going to go and I'm going to do the skin tones. And just as I just said, I'm actually starting with the mid-tone here. I'm using Scale 75's pink flesh, and I'm covering up his face and his hands. Luckily, there's not a ton of flesh that I'll have to paint on this figure. So I'll put in the this the base tone, and then I'll highlight up. And then as my final step, I'll put in the shadows, which again is something that I'm not used to doing. I haven't done a whole lot of. I used to always start with the shadows and work up. So for the first highlight color, I'm taking a little bit of that pink and I'm mixing in some golden flesh by scale 75. And I'm covering most of the skin with this, only leaving the things that I know are going to be in shadow, that uh, initial pink flesh color. So I'm hitting the cheeks, the top of his lip, and uh, really in between his fingers, things like that. Then then we're going with our another highlight, and this is just of the pure golden yellow. Uh, again, just hitting here, less area on the face, really the, I guess the bump of his cheekbone and kind of the, the side of his cheek and the top of his lip, that sort of thing. 
really easy to paint these uh, Saxon or late Roman uh, figures because usually the helmet takes quite a bit of the face. And I'm also using this to kind of sketch out his fingers here, using uh, the pink again as my shadow. And then as the final high highlight, I'm going in with the pale flesh from scale 75, really just putting in dots here. Uh, dots on the side of his cheekbone, on his lip, and where his knuckles are on his hand. And uh, at least the highlights for my flesh tones will be finished. And so now I'm going in with a, a mixture of some scarlet, some um, actually black leather, and a little bit of that pink skin tone, which gives me a nice kind of reddish brown color. And I'm going to sketch in the uh, the shadows on his skin. So along the helm, right beneath his eye kind of dividing up his cheek with it, um, going in between his fingers with this as well, and that will give us some decent contrast. All right, so now we're going to into what was my favorite part of this model, which is this really nice flowing cloak he has here. And I'm going to be using a technique, which I think I've shown on several videos, which is sketching. So first I'm going to sketch in my shadows, which here I'm using a black with a very little bit amount of a, a phthalo blue. And I'm going to be focusing on the parts that I, I know are going to be in deep shadow. And then, just like in my other videos, I'm going to take my base color and thin it down to a glaze and just start glazing over the entire cloak, including these shadow areas, and it will give us a nice little transition. So here I've started taking that phthalo blue by, it's one of the heavy bodied acrylics by Scale 75, and I'm going to be covering the entire cloak. It's it's watered down quite a bit to about a glaze consistency. You can see how the white is still kind of showing through after this first pass. And I'm going to be layering several of these layers so I get a uh, a nice even coat there. You can see as I go over that dark shadow how there's still a pretty uh, obvious dividing line, a pretty harsh transition between the shadows and this mid-tone color. But as we put on more coats, it'll become less and less defined as we keep going. And we're also going to do a little bit of wet blending on certain places to also help uh, ease those harsh transitions. So now I've started mixing in the, a deep blue, and I think it's actually called deep blue, by scale 75 into the phthalo blue, getting a little bit lighter. And this process is what probably took me the most time on this model. I really wanted to get this, I want this cloak to kind of be like the centerpiece of this model. So we're going thin and we're doing uh, multiple coats on the cloak. As you can see, just barely bringing up the, the tone a little bit each time. As you can see, though, that really harsh transition between the shadows and uh, the first highlight are diminished after several coats of that mid-tone. Um, so doing this, I think, is a good way to build up contrast, but also have some pretty decent transitions between the colors. So um, now I'm just taking actually some ivory, mixing it into that deep blue, getting just a lighter blue color. And I'm going to really now be focusing on the edges of his cloak, those top ridges, things like that. And for, you know, the small little folds, it's really easy. You just layer it. You don't really have to worry much about blending. Um, for some of the flatter, rounded areas, I did have to utilize some wet blending, which I'll show you here. But at least in this step, I'm still just doing small layers. So as we put down this layer, I'm starting to realize that I am going to have to wet blend or else the transition is just going to be too sharp. So I put down that light blue color and then I take the mid-tone color and I, while the paint is still wet, kind of mix the two together to give a, a nicer transition there. You often, that's why having wet blending in your box of tricks is nice, uh, especially if you're dealing with cloth that is uh, flat and kind of a, a large diameter of it. Um, wet blending can quickly blend. Uh, some pretty nice transitions. I just now I'm just keep adding a little bit more white into that blue color, highlighting farther and farther up, hitting less and less of the cloak. And as I'm getting up here, I'm going to start kind of making little striations, little hash marks along the edges of my cloak here, just to make it seem like the cloak has a little bit of texture. You can kind of see it there. Uh, it's also a nice way to kind of hide some some transitions that aren't the best blended. And as, again, I'm getting almost up to pure white here. Now we're getting to very, very light blue. And again, I'm just continuing with these hash marks in smaller and smaller areas to give the idea that there is some texture to this cloak. And my final highlight will be a ivory with just a hint of blue in there. And there I'm really just hitting 
the edges, putting some dots, little streaks here and there, just to grab your eye. And with that, our cloak will be finished. So now we're going to move on to how I painted this guy's tunic. And I'm kind of skipping ahead because I actually didn't really like how I painted this tunic. I started off with a black leather by Vallejo, not by Vallejo, by Scale 75. And it has it's almost this purple brown. It's this cool color. So I wanted to use it to like make a burgundy color. For some reason, I picked up the red leather by Scale 75, which actually has kind of an orange tint to it. And as I was layering it up, I realized it was much more orange than I wanted. It wasn't really a burgundy color. So I'm, I'm going to kind of show how, if you're painting and your paint scheme just doesn't work out, how glazes are a great way to tint your paint scheme to keep some of your highlights and lowlights and kind of transform it to a color that you like. So here I just took a scarlet color. I took some scarlet, mixed it in actually with the, the black leather to get kind of a deeper red. I turned it into a glaze by watering it down with some medium. And now I'm just running it over the cloak with several passes. And each time it will make it a little more deep red and a, a lot less orange. And so I'll end up saving the cloak. And here I'm going to go back after several passes of that glaze. And I'm going to touch up some highlights. by I just added some ivory into that scarlet and black leather mix but most of the highlights and lowlights were saved by using glazes it's really just a filter it'll keep your the the tones of your colors pretty well it won't really overshadow any of the highlighting or shadow work that you've done and so i was able to pretty easily save this cloak and here i'm even going back with more of that pure black leather and hitting the uh, low light areas. In fact, I do believe I added a little bit of black in there to make it even darker, just to push the contrast. It's something that I really want to work on with my historical miniatures. I feel that a lot of my miniatures, as I'm getting better at blending, they look really good close up, but from afar, the transitions are still pretty harsh. So uh, hopefully adding some of these extra tones will help bring that contrast out when they're on the table. So now I'm just going to hit the other pieces of leather that I want on there, his belt, this little pouch, and his shoes. I'm taking uh, a very dark brown. I believe I used the, the black and black leather combination I used to shadow his tunic. And here I'm going to use that as the base color for these leather areas. I wanted to keep away. I usually do lighter leather tones, but I felt that it would kind of clash with his tunic that he has here. So I'm going to keep it kind of a darker leather. And here I'm taking that black leather now and highlighting my first layer on his shoes and on that belt. And then for, to highlight this, I'm simply going to take a little bit of ivory and mix it in with it and do just a quick highlight of those leather areas. I spent a lot less time than I used to on leather. I used to really, uh, I don't know, spend 10, 15 minutes painting the leather pieces, but I found, especially the shoes, I'm going to cover this area with quite a bit of static grass. You won't even really see his shoes. And it, the belt is not something that's going to really draw your eye. The other pieces on the on this miniature will. So I'm going to spend a very minute amount of time actually worrying about these leather pieces. And that's kind of a, something I've learned. Don't waste your time on the little details that don't really make the model. Spend the most time on what you think really is uh, the quintessential aspects of the model. For me, it's going to be his cloak and that fur wrapped around his neck. Again, now we're just doing some little pieces here. He has a little bit of his pants showing here, so we're just going to do uh, just a, a kind of a muted gray. We don't want this to be an emphasis. We just want to kind of keep it neutral. So we're just taking a black gray, layering up with a graphite, and then mixing a little bit of ivory into that graphite and hitting it right on the edge of the knee. Again, really simple. Now we're going to take his leg bindings and I want to paint them a linen color. So I took some desert yellow by scale 75 mixed in some ivory. Uh, I have a problem painting linen. I find I always go a little too yellow on it. So to try and uh, make it a little bit more white here, this linen, I'm taking some uh, desert, desert white, desert sands actually by scale 75, mixing it in to that pale yellow color. And I keep highlighting up to more of a white. And I'm going to cover more and more of this because, again, it, it, I felt it was turning a little too yellow. Uh, but in the end, it looks all right. I just need to keep working on how to paint a nice linen color. Uh, trying to use more of a yellow as a shadow instead of using the typical gray or cool blue that I often use to shadow whites. 
And then we are going to uh, just paint his beard here. So I'm going to go for like a little blonde look. But as my base color, whenever I'm painting blonde hair, I like to go for kind of a mid-color brown. And then I'll simply take a little bit of yellow and mix it into that brown and keep adding more and more yellow until I, I get a pretty to a pretty light yellow. So here I'm just making kind of hash marks on his beard here uh, as the first kind of highlight color. Just little streaks uh, across his beard to make it look like there's some texture there to his hair. And then as a final highlight, I'm taking pretty much pure yellow and I'm just hitting the tips of his beard and mustache there. And uh, that's pretty much my recipe I always use for a kind of a dirty blonde look. So now I'm going to paint the spear, and I'm going to try something new with this spear. I always feel like my spears, uh, they never look very good. They're either too brown, or I try and make them kind of a pine, white, yellow kind of thing, and it never looks very good. I'm never good at like drawing contrasts on the spear. So I'm going to try something different that I've seen some painters use, where I'm going to put my mid-tone color down. Then I'm going to come back with a very dark brown. I'm going to actually hit the ends, the end of the spear, and then right below the spear shaft with a very dark color to hopefully draw your eye to the middle of the spear shaft and to at least give some contrast, something interesting going on with the spear. So you're, it looks like a pretty stark contrast right there, but after I put that shadow color down, that dark brown, I'm actually going to go back with the mid-tone and water it down a little bit and just bring it over that a dark area so the transition isn't so harsh so they can see the transition looks a little bit better then i'm taking my brown color mixing in some yellow and then finally mixing in some ivory into that yellow and kind of making like uh i don't know like a wood grain running up the spear and so now we're going to get to his cloak and here again i'm going to utilize some wet blending here i'm going to try the technique that i know that sam lens uses he likes to use kind of like tri-color furs he likes using multiple colors of uh multiple colors when he's making his fur so here i took a gray and i'm trying to make like a wolf pelt here you know wolf pelts have some gray some whites even some browns in them so i took a gray put a medium chestnut brown next to it, and then I'm just kind of working the two colors together. As you can see, the brown goes from a really stark brown to kind of a muted brownish gray. Then I'm taking an ivory off-white color and putting that right next to that brown color, and then I'm mixing them all together. And I did find that I wanted a little bit more brown. I felt the brown was a little bit too subdued. So I just add a little bit more brown in there and then mix them together with all the colors. And this is a great way to practice wet blending on something like a fur, something that doesn't need to be exact. It's not like the fold of a cloak. You can be pretty messy with this and just see how the different colors combine. And then I'm over brushing, not dry brushing. I have a pretty loaded brush, and I'm going over it with a uh, white sands color to highlight it. And this will also kind of draw the colors together. They'll all share a common highlight, and we'll be done with this cloak. And so really the final step I have to do here is to, I'm going to add some brass or bronze sections to his armor. So I'm doing this little nose garden eyepiece and I'm putting down some Vallejo copper, which is a great base color for any bronze or gold you do. It, ha it covers very nicely. You don't have to oftentimes with bronze colors, you have to put down a brown first before you apply the bronze. You don't have to do that with the Vallejo. And then to, uh, as a first highlight, I'm actually taking P3 gold and uh, over brushing it again Vallejo metal colors are not good for over brushing or dry brushing they're too liquid based so whenever I want to do dry brushing over brushing I, I do usually prefer the p3 metallics and then as my high highlight once I got that over brushing done I'm just touching the edges of uh, his nose guard and kind of eyepiece here with some Vallejo metal gold that I mix a little bit of silver in there to get a really light gold color and I'm just going to hit the edges of his helm with that. And once we get this gold done, we are finished. So here is my finished uh, Knight of the Round Table. I guess you would say here's Tristan. And I love this range. These models are fantastic. I have a bunch of them sitting around from, uh, I, from the Saxon army that I've been working on. And every time I paint one of these, I'm just impressed how well they take the paint and how dynamic the poses are, just how well they come out. So, you know, if you're in the market for some medieval warriors, some dark age warriors, go check out Footsore, especially their sub-Roman range. All of their Arthurian figures can often work for other Germanic, uh, Germanic armies from that time period. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this. 
it's good making another video. It's been a while. I hope you all are doing all right out there. So until next time, take care, and I'll see you guys soon.